Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Don. I'm an alcoholic. Absolutely delighted to be included in this weekend. What a fantastic celebration of sobriety, the enthusiasm, the spirit. If there ever ever was a football chant in an event like that, we would just chant, We didn't die. We didn't die. And we'd be... But they're already scared enough of us, aren't they? I want to thank Jimmy and Mary Beth for uh, including me in this, and the, the committee that did the, uh, the all the hard work that makes something like this seem seamless. You don't you don't see the hard work, and that's how you know how effective it was. And it's like, oh yeah, it was just perfect. Everything came together, and it was easy. And yeah, join the committee next year. I've been doing committee work for uh, 28 years. It's a big part of what I do in sobriety. I, I love committee work, and I'm sure your committee's just like ours. Uh, everybody gets along like kittens, and. Uh, Never disagree on anything, and it's a real democracy. And uh, but thank you for all the hard work you've put in. I want to thank Kurt and Drew for picking up my friend Craig and I at the airport. And uh, you know that's the wonderful thing. You, you know, C- Craig's never been traveling in AA, and he wanted to come to this event. We live in Bellingham, Washington, on the West Coast, and and he asked me questions that people would normally ask in a situation like this, like, "Well, well who's picking this up?" Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Where are we going? Somewhere in New Jersey. <laughs> What's going to happen? Stuff. You know, because that, it doesn't really matter, does it? You know, when I'm with you, it really doesn't matter. I don't need a lot of information when I'm with you. I know I'm going to be taken care of. I know I'm going to be fine. I have a sobriety date in September 16, 1991. That puts me at the 31-year mark, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. I have a uh, thank you. Once again, if you're new and you hear this applause, we never actually applaud for people. We're applauding for Alcoholics Anonymous because we know the person really hasn't done anything, just so you know that. Uh, I have a sponsor. I think that's important. uh, And also that he knows he's my sponsor. Uh, He may be regretful about that, but he knows he's my sponsor. He's 41 years sober. His name's Vin Kay. He lives in Bellingham, Washington. And uh, the best thing I can say about Vin is he's completely unimpressed with me. And... uh, (laughs) If I had a prayer for you, it would be that your sponsor is unimpressed with you. What a great gift that is, to have somebody that cares more about you hearing the truth than your approval. Somebody that can cut through your stuff. Somebody that really develops that relationship of transparency that's with you. Because I don't care how long I'm sober. I don't care how diligently I work these steps. I don't care how much service work I do. I will always have alcoholism, this disease of perception... This thing that seems to hang up in my in front of my face, this veil of distortion made up of my wants, my fears, my desires, that at any given moment I think I'm seeing reality, but I'm not. And I need that third-person point of view, somebody I've spent the time and built a relationship with that knows me, knows my reactions, knows the way that I live life on life's terms, that can see when I'm off the beam. And it's so valuable, and I'm so grateful for sponsorship in my life. I have a home group. And I love my home group, and I hope you love your home group. It's the SOS Men's Group. We meet on Monday and Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock at St. James Church on 14th Street in the Fairhaven District of Bellingham, Washington. And as I said, it's a men's group, right, where men are men, and the mental illness is not accurately measurable. Uh, <laughs> and and what, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story about my home group, just to give you an idea of the vibe of my home group. Uh, so I'm 25 years sober. I've been in that home group for 18 years. It's about six years ago. We have it, like most good home groups, you have a conveyor belt of misery to your front door. People are coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. They're coming looking for a new life. They're coming because they don't know what else to do. They're coming looking for a solution. But they wash up on the rocky shores of AA, and it's our job to be there and welcome them. And we have a plan in place for when new men wash up on our shore. And about six years ago, these two guys came in about the same time, within a couple of weeks of each other, Ben and Matt. And I love these guys because Ben and Matt are the kind of alcoholics I love because I identify with them. You know what I mean? 
It's like when people told them they were going to die, that they burned their life to the ground, that they were hurting everyone around them. You know, when they said, you've hit a bottom, they just decorated the bottom. You know what I mean? They stayed out there as long as they possibly could. So they were at death's door, you know. And that's the thing about AA. The worse you are, the more we like you. You know, we just love that when you come in broken, you know. And we get excited. You know, like, I got warts for my arrest. Ooh, tell me more. You know, it's just... I'm hopelessly in debt. That's terrific, you know. <laughs> I live at my mom's. Of course you do, you know. It's <laughs> and these are typical newcomer knuckleheads, right? They, they come in and they find a home. Because that happens quickly. If you're broken and you're willing and you're looking for an answer and you have what I have and you walk into good AA, it speaks to you. It crosses the boundaries. It cuts through the paranoia. It cuts through the prejudice. And it gets to the heart of the matter. And you can't deny that there's something going on here when you're new, when you don't have the vocabulary, you don't have the understanding, you haven't read the book, you don't have a God of your own understanding, but you recognize safety and you feel love and you're able to receive kindness. And for many of us, that's the first time that's happened in a lot of years. And these guys were like many new guys that come to our group. Very quickly, they got involved. They got sponsors. But they're new. They have no lives. They've burned them to the ground. And they've got all this energy. You get a lot of energy when you get sober. Because when you're not spending every nickel and dime you have on drinking and that other crap, you're suddenly perky. And what do we do to our newcomers when they get here? We give them a caffeine addiction, first thing. <laughs> well, I don't really drink coffee. Well, you do now, Scooter. <laughs> That's it, just fill it up, yeah. And so they're like typical new guys. They're hanging out together after the meetings, and they're getting in trouble, and they're, they're doing all this goofy stuff trying to keep themselves entertained between meetings. And one of the goofy things they did is they ordered a tattoo gun from Amazon. I want to be clear. Neither one of them is a tattoo artist. Didn't stop them. They never thought about that small little detail. And so after meetings, what are they doing to entertain themselves? They're giving each other tattoos. Did they find out they're natural artists? Oh, no, these are horrible tattoos. And they're coming in. They're proud of them. They're showing them the matching dumpster fire tattoos they gave each other. And it just goes on. And I'm looking at these guys, and I love them so much because they're so goofy. They're so on fire with AA, and they're so entertaining. You know what I mean? You need that entertainment. And they made it to a year. I couldn't believe it, you know? And within two weeks of each other, they celebrate a year. And I'm talking with them after the meeting, and they're pretty cocky at this point because they got a year. And when you're a daily drunk and you get a year, you've been sober forever. And you really have. It feels like forever. You've done some work, and they've done well. And we're having that snappy rap partay that happens in a men's group. They're insulting me. I'm insulting them. And that's the way we deliver love sometimes among the men in Alcoholics Anonymous. And at one point in this long conversation I was having with them, I said, listen, we see a lot of one-year celebrations at AA. We don't see anything like five years. And they go, oh, we're going to get five years. I go, I don't know. You're going to have to pick your game up a little bit because you're doing some pretty goofy stuff. And I'm telling you, if you're going to stay here, you're going to have to really pick it up. In fact, I'm so concerned about you that if you were to get anything like five years, oh, my God, I'd let you tattoo me. <laughs> And their faces changed. <laughs> you ever see a glint in a dog's eye right before he attacks you? It was like that. <laughs> I want to be very clear. I'm not a tattoo guy. I don't have a single tattoo on my body at that moment. <laughs> you fast forward. I'm celebrating 30 years of sobriety. And guess who's celebrating five years of sobriety? And what has happened leading up to that? One night, 2 o'clock in the morning, my phone rings. Matt had just got four years, and this is what I hear. I just got four years, and I haven't forgotten. And he hangs up on me. <laughs> when Ben took his three-year coin, he found me in the audience, and he just went... I turned 30 years sober. My, my sponsor, my friends, my family, my sponsees, everybody threw me a big 30-year party, and it was great. Everybody showed up. We had great food, having a great time. It was just all this love in the air. And men in batch, uh, Ben showed up with their tattoo gun. <laughs> and on my 30-year birthday, 
in front of my sponsees, my sponsor, my wife, who knew nothing about it that was mortified. <laughs> and everybody that I knew, I got my first tattoo of my life. And I'd love to tell you that it's a thing of beauty. I'll show you later if you want to see it. It looks like fourth day meth run, shaky hand. <laughs> Backwoods, Kentucky, County Jail. <laughs> Matt gave me the tattoo. His hand was shaking so bad. I said, Matt, are you sure you're sober? I'm nervous, he tells me. <laughs> and everybody had a good laugh at my expense. But that's not the best part of the story. Ben walks over to look at Matt's work, and he goes, yeah, it's not bad. But I don't think it's as good as mine. Now, what they had tattooed is my wife's initial with a, supposedly a heart on it that doesn't look like a heart. <laughs> and I say to Ben, what are you talking about? And Ben pulls up his shorts, and there on Ben's thigh is a duplicate of the tattoo I just got. My wife's initial with a heart around it. <laughs> and I say to Ben, I go... Ben, why in the world would you get a tattoo of my wife's initial on your thigh? And he said, well, you had to practice. <laughs> so if you're in Bellingham on a Monday or Wednesday night, please come and visit us at the SOS Men's Group. We'll make you feel welcome, among other things. Love my home group. Love Alcoholics Anonymous. I think uh, I want to take a moment to thank all the other speakers just taking us on a journey through the steps, doing a, such an outstanding job, leaving nothing out, such depth and weight, such insight, uh, so many pearls of wisdom. Uh, that all ends right here, just so you know. Um, I'm a meat and potatoes guy. I have no new information. I have to tell you that. But somehow, I'm living proof that you can stay sober 31 years and you don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to be a step technician, and that the power that we talk about in Alcoholics Anonymous is available to every man and woman that walks into Alcoholics Anonymous was available to this drunken loser on September 16, 1991, when I walked in the doors of AA and all the good was gone. You see, I'm a product of Alcoholics Anonymous. I can't take credit for the good life that I have. You see, my second night in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm planning a drunk. I'm going to leave AA and it's going to cost me everything. I burned my life to the ground. I got warrants for my arrest in two counties because I'm an overachiever. I don't have a car. I haven't worked in a year. I'm living at my sister's house because when the going gets tough, the tough go home. I have 80 grand in debt to the IRS. I have all these wonderful facts of my life. I've taken the potential that people have told me I've had my whole life. And I've rolled it into a weapon, into a ball, and I push it up the hill of life. And the best thing I could do is end up more dead than alive in Alcoholics Anonymous at age 31. And I need to hear myself say that. I don't care what that means to you. It means so much to me that I remember the guy that walked in here. And he's still with us tonight. And when we talk about steps six and seven, it's so important that I remember that that stuff's alive and well within me. Oh, I'd love to think it's gone, wouldn't I? But how many times, right before I said it, did it, thought it, felt it, I would have put my hand on the Bible and said I'm incapable of that. I would have passed the lie detector test, yet I did it. The delusion of the alcoholic. These false psychotic beliefs that live in my head that allow me to think I'm doing better than I really am, or, I'm doing, or I think I'm doing worse than I really am. I need a lot of help to stay sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. I need a lot of help to live life on life's terms, to cushion the concussion of just living out in the world, a world that I never had an answer for until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. The only answer I had was whiskey, and it worked great. And when it turned on me, everything changed. You see, I'm a product of Alcoholics Anonymous of our 12th step. I'm the guy leaving AA to go get drunk. And a couple of good AA members took what I believe is the most important action we'll ever have the honor and privilege of taking in AA. They just walked across the room and they introduced themselves. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Sounds easy. I want to tell you something. That saves lives. Because I'm leaving, I'm getting drunk, and you can't tell by looking at me, but that's my plan and I'm going to execute it. It'll cost me everything and eventually cost me my life, and it's a small price to pay. If I can make the madness in my head stop for a couple of hours, a price I've always been willing to pay. Why? Because I've lost the power of choice. I don't have a hand in this game. 
You see, these men understood that. They understood that they would have to carry the message to the alcoholic that still suffers. And they brought me into the circle. And AA can happen quick if you're in the right place at the right time. It feels like lightning in a bottle, but I'm telling you something. It's going to happen all over the world today and tonight. It's happening all over the world today and tonight. Sobriety begins with one alcoholic reaches out to another alcoholic. He speaks the language of the heart to reduce their feelings of difference so they can start to take actions they don't yet believe in. It happened so quick for me. I sat down with these two guys. One of them said, this is Mark. He'll be your sponsor. He walked away. I don't know what they're talking about. And it doesn't matter, does it? Because they know what they're talking about. It doesn't matter if the suffering alcoholic knows anything about AA, steps, God, recovery, working with others, the end of selfishness. It doesn't matter if I know anything about that. What matters is they knew. And it's funny, my sponsor had so many beautiful things in his life the night that I met him. And he gave them all to me, didn't he? He had a home group. He had commitments at the home group. He was in the literature. He was working the steps. He was working with others. He had a hundred friends. He took all those tools from his toolbox and he handed them to the newcomer. They set them at our feet for our inspection, don't they? Now, I don't know how to use them. You see, we're given sobriety when we're new, and it's a gift, but it's a gift that comes unassembled. But you see, we come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and we sit with the masters, and you know what they're masterful at? Putting the gift together. See, I didn't put the gift together. You did. You showed me how to do it. You showed me how to work these steps. You showed me not just what it says in the book, but how to take it from the page and live it in my life. And we got into the steps immediately. My sponsor used to have a little saying, he'd say, hurry, hurry, lest the test comes early. There will come a time in every alcoholic's life where we have no effective mental defense against the first drink. At such times, his defense must come from a higher power. He says, you don't have a higher power right now. You don't have a relationship with God that's going to save you from that first drink. He said, what am I going to do? He goes, you're going to get in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous and we're going to circle you. And we're going to keep you safe and protected till you have the same thing happen in your life that happened in ours. You're going to have that spiritual awakening. And you look at the roadmap. You look at the work they lay out in front of you, those 12 steps. You go into those open AA meetings. You're hearing people share about that inventory, sharing about, sharing about making those amends, right? And you're looking at this, and it seems like work, doesn't it? Oh, it's so much work you're going to ask me to do. And then they tell you what you get. What do I get? Do I get rich? Maybe. Maybe not. Do I get a good-looking woman? They look at me and go, probably not. <laughs> do I get famous? Unlikely. But what do I get? You get a spiritual awakening. And? Because it seems like an inadequate reward, doesn't it, for a selfish, self-centered alcoholic. And it turns out this spiritual awakening that we talk about in AA is the keys to the kingdom. It's the most valuable thing I've ever had in my life. And it's so simple I would have missed it. If you explained it to me in the simple language, I would have been able to understand. I wouldn't have seen the value in it. Spiritual awakening. All it means is my whole life, I was asleep. You took me through this process. And you woke me up to the fact that there's a power that runs this deal, that loves me and loves you and wants to help and is available to me right now. I did not know that. It changed revolutionized, and saved my life. My sponsor gets me through the steps very quickly. That's the way we did it in my home group where I got sober. I went through steps one, two, and three very quickly. I had no argument for that. You think you're powerless over alcohol? Look at my track record. You think your life's unmanageable? And you know, that's a whole other conversation, but it was covered so wonderfully, I'm not going to spend any time on that. Step two, I don't believe in God. I remember telling my sponsor when he told me, go home and pray tonight. I said, I don't believe in God. He goes, that's okay. He believes in you. Go home and pray tonight. And I got argumentative. And he said, you don't have to believe in God to pray. I said, I don't. He goes, your knees work? And I go, well, yeah. He goes, great. Humor me. My second night of recovery, I'm on my knees praying to a God I don't believe in. Didn't seem to offend God because I'm still here. Isn't that something? If I had waited till I believed, we'd still be waiting. You know what I mean? Sometimes, Because I would have never got the gift. I would have got stuck on step two. And step three, I thank you for my step three experience. I thank all of you. I can't take credit for it. I can't take, my sponsor can't take credit for it. I went to meetings with people like you. And you made sobriety look good. God, you made it look good. 
I never experienced anything in my life that you were describing. Yet you told your stories. And I identified. I knew you had been where I had been and you had lived the way I would lived and you drank the way I drank and you weren't living or drinking that way anymore. And you gave credit to this mystical power I didn't believe in. Every single one of you. And he talked about the sweetness of the relationship with God. And it made me want a relationship of my own. So I made that commitment, didn't I? That I'm going to go through the process in steps four through nine so I can come out the other end and have a relationship with this power you so beautifully described. And so I write that inventory. And I'm excited. I like writing that inventory. i got to tell you, because I read the fifth step promises in the big book, and it sounded great. Once we step, take the step, we are delighted. We can look the world in the eye. Our fears fall from us. You know, it goes on and on, and I'm like, you know, before I do my fifth step, I'm not sleeping at night. I'm racked with guilt, shame, and remorse. I'm more familiar with what the tops of my shoes look like than your face because I can't look anyone in the eye. I can't, you know, and people are coming in that have just done their fifth step, and, oh, you know those people. They're just like, ah, I did my fifth step last night with my sponsor, and I just feel like the weight of the world's off my back, and I feel so wonderful, and I feel the nearness of my creator, and... And I really feel like I've joined AA, and you're just like, man, I need some of that, because I'm homicidal, suicidal, homicidal, suicidal. <laughs> and I do that fist step, man. It was blood, sweat, and tears, man. I put all that stuff down I was going to take to my grave. And it's, oh, it's embarrassing. And it's shameful. Because this trip I took, this descent into hell that is active alcoholism, I did it alone. I did it alone, man. Nobody was trying to hurt me. That was me executing plan A. And not only that, while I was going towards hell, I was surrounded by people that loved me and wanted the best things in the world for me. And they were laying down across the tracks of active alcoholism, and they were taking the brunt of the collision while they tried to stop my descent into hell, and I didn't slow me down a bit. I'm not happy when I'm done with my fifth step, but that's okay because you promised. The promises are in the book. I'm sure they're coming. Next day after I do my fifth step, I feel worse than I've ever felt in my life. That's okay. It's God's will, not my will. God's time, not Don's time. Day two, I know it's going to be better. Day two, I'm crazy. I can't look at anybody. I barely made it through the work day. I hate myself. Day three, I'm suicidal. I'm going to end it. I can't take it. And I call my sponsor up. I go, we need to talk. And he goes, what's wrong? And I go, the fist step. He goes, yeah. And I go, it didn't work. And he goes, what makes you think it didn't work? And I go, buddy. I've never felt so dirty and filthy and disgusting in my entire life. And he laughs. He goes, Don, I was there for your fifth step. You should feel dirty and filthy and disgusting. He goes, Don, steps four through nine. You just finished step five. You're not through the process. This is a design for living. This isn't pick as you go. This isn't, you know... <laughs> a la carte. And I begin to understand when I did my first inventory the danger of thinking the steps aren't interconnected. The danger of thinking that I can do some of the steps but not all of the steps. The danger of not seeing the design of living and keeping this compartmentalization in my mind. Thinking that they don't have everything to do with each other, that they're interlinked. I hear people say things to me like, I got a step seven problem. I got a step 11 problem. I got a step 10 problem. You got a design for living problem. You can't have a problem with one step without having a problem with all the steps. That's the fact of the matter. And I did six and seven the way every good newcomer does six and seven. We look at it. It's two paragraphs in the book. We pause for an hour before we read it. And we think, whoo, about time I got a break. And then you move on. And that's my step six and seven experience when I'm new. And I'm here to tell you. You can stay sober and build a hell of a life for yourself, ignoring steps six and seven, because I did it. But here's what you got to do. You got to build a hell of a stage character, and you got to do it in AA. And I got to tell you, I built a juggernaut of a stage character. You know what I mean? I'm at every meeting. I got commitments at every meeting. I'm sponsoring half of North America by the time I'm eight years sober. I'm speaking all over Los Angeles, you know. Meetings are calling me up. they got requirements. you got to have 15 years sobriety to speak there. And they go, well, we're going to make an exception for you. And my ego goes, of course you are. Of course you are. And all my dreams start coming true. 
right? Because I got stuff I hear other men talk about in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I know it's never going to happen for me. Talk about finding a girl and falling in love and having a real relationship, an honest relationship with somebody that respects you and you respect them. I know that's never going to happen for me. And at three years sober, I meet the beautiful Eileen, and we just celebrated 26 years of marriage in June. In June. And I knew that was never going to happen for me, and now I got her in my life. And I recognize it for what it is. It's a gift from God. This kind of woman that's so classy, so smart, so wonderful. I couldn't get a woman like that to look at me, let alone cross the street to talk to me. And yet suddenly she's my wife. I come to Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm hopelessly in debt, but I do the work described in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous with the sponsor's tutelage, and I get out of debt. And a funny thing happens when you get out of debt and you stop blowing all your dough on that other stuff. You get a few bucks together, and suddenly I'm a homeowner. And my wife and I are laying in bed at night, and they approved us for a loan, and we think it's hilarious. They go, they approved our loan. They're crazy. And And now I'm a homeowner, and I drive a nice vehicle, and I get a career, and I heard guys talk about having careers. We went, and you give them a dime for a dime's work. And you showed up early, and you stayed late, and men respected you, and you did it because it needed to be done, not looking for anything but to be of service. And I get myself a career. And the way I got that career was really, really the first time that I had to go back and look at steps six and seven. You know, and I was working construction. I'd work, work in, there's nothing wrong with working construction. If you're in construction, good for you. But I found out early in sobriety when my sponsor came to me and said, you've never worked with your hands. And I said, that's true. And he said, that's fascinating. And he got me a job as a laborer on a framing crew. And I went to work with my hands. I'd love to tell you I found out it was my true calling. Nothing could be further from the truth. I had a nickname on the job site, the bleeder. So so my first three years of sobriety, I went to work, bled all day, and then went to AA at night. And somehow my life got better, bandages and all. But I'm three years sober, and I'm talking to my sponsor, and I'm telling him things like, I don't think I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm not very good at it. I, I, don't, I don't like it. I feel like there's something else I'm supposed to be doing. And I don't know what to do. Do I need to go to school? Do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? And he goes, I don't know, Don. You're a good AA member. you got a relationship with God. Hey, you know, God's going to put something in your path, and your job's going to be to say yes. And I said, that's it? And he goes, yeah, that's it. And I thought, he doesn't have an answer. About a week later, I get an opportunity to go interview with this company, but it's a job I don't want. It's straight commission sales. I don't like people. It's a loser's game. It's in the roofing industry. I know nothing about roofing. What do I know? A roof is a great place to hide from the cops. That's all I know about roofing. So I call my sponsor up to tell him about this opportunity I have that I'm not going to go interview for. And he goes, well, I want you to go interview. And I said, yeah, but I don't want to. And he goes, funny, I don't remember asking you what you wanted to do. And I know where that goes, right? So I interviewed for this job, and they hired me on the spot. And uh, and I'm pissed. Usually when they hire you on the spot, it's a celebration. Welcome to the team. And I remember thinking, damn it. And uh, called my sponsor up. I said, well, they hired me. Now what do I do? He goes, go to work for them. And I go to work in the roofing industry trying to sell roofs, and I'm running on 100% Self-will. I want to be clear about that. Complete self-will run riot. I get up in the morning, I pray, I meditate, and as I go out the front door, that spiritual guillotine comes down, severs my conscious contact. I run on self-will full of fear and anxiety all day in collision with everybody and everything all day long, and then I go to meetings and hopefully you'll call me and I'll say something spiritual. And that's the best I can do. And it's getting worse, and it's not like I'm not trying. It's not like I'm not applying self-reliance. What am I doing? I'm reading sales books at night. Well, you know the problem with reading sales books at night? They all have different techniques. So every day I'm a different salesman. So I'm psychotic. What salesman am I today? And it's getting worse, man. The company slide me 500 bucks a week against commissions I don't have. I'm there for three months and I owe them $5,000. And I'm begging my sponsor to let me quit the job. And he goes, what do they say? Ah, nobody sells at first. They think it'll the ship will ride itself by the end of the first year. And I'm like you got to be kidding me, and he won't let me quit. And I'm like, buddy, I owe the IRS 80 grand. They're anxious. Can we we got to make some money here. Won't let me quit the job. You get to quit when they stop inviting you back. So i got to go to work at this job I suck at. And it's getting worse. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. And I finally hit my bottom with this job. I show up at this lady's house. Nice lady. 
we have a little interview at her front stoop. I'm going to go up on the roof and measure the roof. And I'd been reading this book, right? And this book had a chapter called Instant Identification. And they said that you got 30 seconds after you meet somebody to find a way to identify with them, right? They got a fish in the wall. What a coincidence. I love fishing, right? They got a nice garden. I love gardening, right? They got a classic car in the driveway. Oh, is that a 54? You know, find some way to connect with them. So I get down off the roof. I'm talking to her again, and I'm looking for it. I'm looking for the instant identification. I'm looking high. I can't see it. Nothing. And then I saw it. I went, there it is. And without thinking, I say this. I go, oh, so how far along are you? Everything had been going great up to that moment. Her whole face changes. And she says, what do you mean? Now, anybody with half a brain in their head would have dropped the shovel and quit digging, right? But I'm an alcoholic, man. We don't know how to stop once we engage. I'm like, well, you're pregnant, aren't you? And she says, no. And the silver side of my brain is like, drop the shovel, drop the shovel. But I can't. I'm engaged, right? I'm, I'm committed. Did you have a kid recently? <laughs> She says, two years ago, I said, I want to thank you for the opportunity to earn your business. I go back out to my vehicle. I, I can't start the car because I'm crying. I'm so embarrassed, and I'm so stupid, and I'm so pathetic. And why did I think this thing would work out for me? Why did I think it was good enough to do this job? And I'm I'm banging my head on the steering wheel. I'm stupid, stupid, stupid. And I call my sponsor. And now he's got tears running down his face because he can't stop laughing. <laughs> and he makes me promise not to tell anyone the story at the meeting that night till he gets there so he can watch their faces. <laughs> That night in the parking lot, my sponsor had a brief conversation with me that went something like this. He said, well, it looks like you've taken this job about as far as you can. What do you say we give God a shot at it? He goes, why don't you just go there and treat him the way you think God would have you treat him? Why don't you go there and do what you think God would have you do? Stop making it about winning and losing. Start making it about service. And he stopped talking. I didn't sleep a lot that night, and I thought a lot about it. I thought about all my character defects at play. And I thought about step six and seven. I started to get a glimpse into really the foundation of what step six is. You see, in step seven, what's the first word? Humbly, right? Humbly ask to remove our shortcomings. Well, before I can humbly ask God to remove my shortcomings, I have to experience some humility. And you know how a guy like me experiences humility again and again and again? Is I run on the folly of self-reliance. What does it say about self-reliance in the fear inventory? Self-reliance was good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough and it didn't fully solve the fear problem. And when it worked, it made us cocky. And how many times have I experienced the fruits of self-reliance only to become arrogant? How many times have we seen humility turn to arrogance, our confidence turn into conceit? How many times? So I go to work at this company. I can't give a roof away, let alone sell one. And, that, and that's a great place to be in. Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose, and I got nothing left to lose. My sponsor won't let me quit the job. I'm horrible at it. I'm going to die in the streets alone. So be it. And I go to work, and I just start trying to serve him. I start doing the craziest stuff I've ever done in my life in the business world. You know what I started doing? I started telling them the truth. It was nuts. Somebody would ask me a question about roofing. I go, I got to tell you, I've only been doing this like three, four months. I really don't know what I'm doing. 
But I work for a great company. And I'll tell you, man, I've been on enough roofs that our guys build. These guys really know what they're doing. And they really want you to be happy. And I know this much. I'll walk you through every step of the process. And I'll listen to you and do anything I can to make sure you're happy through it. I just want to be a service to you. And I start selling roofs without any effort on my part. I walk away from people. I go, there's no way that guy's going to call me. There's a message in the office by the time I get back, call so-and-so. And he goes, you're the first guy that's been honest with me in business in 10 years. He goes, I love that you're willing to tell people you don't know what you're doing. He goes, nobody knows what they're doing when they start. <laughs> I thought I'd discovered some new sales technique, right? Thought, I'm an idiot, but I'll be nice, you know. <laughs> But it's funny about the magnificent ego of the alcoholic. I went from that experience, banging my head on a steering wheel, hating myself for my inadequacies, to surrendering, experiencing the humility of step six, actually being able to go to God in step seven and turn that over to him and say, this is none of my business anymore. You tell me how this is supposed to go. I'm just going to treat him the way I think you would treat him. I go from that to that, to what? Successful. And I'm making more money than I'd ever thought I'd make in my life. And how quick do you think I edged God out? How quick did my ego step up and go, look how well I'm doing? How quick did I think I'm the sharpest knife in the drawer? How quick was I willing to take the credit for all of it? And I marched down the road, and my life got better. And now I don't have money problems. And now I pay back everybody. And now we got a house, and now we're married, and I got a big AA stage character, don't I? And I look good. <laughs> and I lay in bed at night, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I do the spiritual math, right? Got a beautiful wife, got a beautiful house, got a beautiful career, got lots of money, sponsor a lot of guys in AA. I'm part of a great home group. Everybody respects me there. Sun's always on my back, wind's always in my face. Gosh, if it's any better, I go in the backyard and I'd hang myself. And I can't feel any of it. I try to talk to other AA members about, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't have any problems. I never thought my life would look this good on paper, but I'm unhappy. I'm anxious. I'm fearful. I'm quick to misery and depression. I'm quick to resentment. I'm quick to judgment of others. I don't like the way I'm feeling. And you know what they do if they don't understand step six and seven? They try to talk you out of it, don't they? They give you the same spiritual math path that you're doing at night alone in your bed every night. Oh, my God, Don, you're married to a beautiful woman. You have a beautiful house. You're well-respected in AA. You make a lot of money. You drive a nice car. You should be having You sitting there, you nod your head like, yeah, that should be the damn answer, shouldn't it? And it may be the answer for people that aren't alcoholic. And it may be the answer for people that don't suffer from what I suffer from. But what I suffer from... Spiritual progress must always precede material progress, and I had no spiritual progress. So you can put all the gold in the kingdom at my feet, and it won't do a damn thing for my spiritual condition. You know what alcoholics, in my opinion, do better? We do this, we do this better than any group of people I've ever seen. We do wrong really well. We are so comfortable. I heard it from the podium. Chaos, right? We love chaos. Right? That's not just, that's an al who said it. It's the family disease. We like it when a challenge. Other people are like, oh no, we could die. We're like running to the front. We're in the bar. There's gunshots. I wonder what that's about. You know, we just. <laughs> like a moth to a flame. We do wrong really well. And you know why? My God, please give me something. Give me something that I can point to to explain why I feel so crazy. Give me a bad medical diagnosis. Give me a reversal of fortune. Give me a broken heart. Give me something that I can go, that's why I'm so screwed up. That's why I'm so sad. Look, it's there. If this happened to you, you'd feel the way that I feel. Give me something that I can point to. You know what makes a guy like me crazy? Absolutely crazy. When there's nothing wrong, <laughs> but I feel like something's wrong. You go to your sponsor and you go, I just have this sense of impending doom. And he goes, you know what that is, don't you? And I go, no. And he goes, that's doom impending. And, uh... <laughs> and I got trouble in my home, man. I got trouble in my home. 
I love my wife, Eileen, like good poetry, you know, but we're fight, we fight all the time. We fight over stupid stuff. I'm self will run riot in the marriage, man. It's my way or the highway, and I'm dug in. I call up my sponsor, man. I call my sponsor to tell him her latest indiscretion, her latest inappropriate thing. She said, go tattle to my sponsor on my wife like a little boy consistently. Like that's going to change anything. Here's what she did now. Let me tell you what she did now. And he'd never, he'd listen for a few minutes. He'd go, let me ask you something, Don. What were you doing during all this? Well, me? I don't know, being loving and tolerant mostly. Why do you ask? Because <laughs> now I've got the stage character with my sponsor. I've lost the transparency. I've got an ego and an image in my own mind that I have to upkeep. I've been sober too long. I'm nine years sober. I'm ten years sober. And I can't get along with my wife. And I love her like good poetry. I'm driving home from work and some sappy love song comes on the radio. And it reminds me of my wife. And I think how bad I've been acting. And I go, I got to do better. I love her. I know I can do better. And it produces hope in me. And the tears are running down my face. And I can't wait to go home and look her in the eye and go, baby, it's going to be different. I'm so sorry. I don't want to live this way anymore. And I walk in the door and she asks me how my day was. And it just pisses me off. Because running on self-will long enough and hard enough builds a wall between me and the rest of the world. And now when you love me, I can't feel it. And I feel like I'm starving at a banquet. And I go to AA with people that have real recovery. And I can mimic the words. And I can say the phrases. And I know I'm in trouble. And I don't know what to do. And what had to happen for me is I had to blow that marriage up. And I blew it up in a lot of different ways. I blew it up in the years leading up to it. And at 11 years sober, I scared my wife so bad she left the house. She left the house because we were in the middle of a cuss fight. And I picked my wife up. And I said, you said no profanity because now we got rules. You ever been in that house? You ever been in that marriage where it's so bad you think rules are going to stop it? Don't talk about anything major after 9 o'clock at night. No profanity allowed. It's insightful. We had rules, and it was getting worse. The rules are making it worse. And I picked my wife up by the shoulders, and I said to her, you got to pull your head out of your rear end. And I thought I just set her down. And I watched my wife sell down a hallway backwards, and I didn't even realize I extended my arms. And it freaked me out. It scared the hell out of me. And I ran to pick her up. And she ran from me as fast as she could out of that house. A woman that I stood up in front of God and all my friends and promised to protect and cherish and honor ran from me like she was running for her life. We are in therapy months later, and I asked her why she ran from me when I was just going to help her and apologize. And she said, I thought you were coming to finish me off. You see, I want to tell you a talk today that makes you like me. I want to talk about how spiritual I am and all the gifts in my life, and I could do that. That was 20 years ago. And I sit here and I feel the shame that I felt 20 years ago. And my wife left that house and I sat down on the couch and I thought, I threw it all away. You gave me everything. And I threw it all away. And I watched the light change in the room, and I watched the shadows come in the room, and I watched the room become dark, and I watched the sun come up the next day, and I couldn't get off the couch. I couldn't call my sponsor. And I didn't want a pina colada. I didn't want a southern comfort and ginger. I wanted to put a bullet in my mouth because I knew there was something wrong with me that Alcoholics Anonymous couldn't fix. And now, at 11 years sober, 7 years married, at the lowest point of my existence in sobriety, I didn't realize how dark it was before the dawn. I didn't realize that I finally had the kind of humility that we're talking about in step six that allows me to go to step seven with a clear understanding that it's not just about the drink anymore. That of myself, I am nothing. And the Father does it the work. 
I'm a guy that played tag with my character defects for years and years and years, and I finally got caught. And there was no escaping the fact that this is the best I do when I run on self-reliance. You see, I think step six, the real work in step six is go out there and live your life and do the best that you can. And you don't have to work on humility. Humility will find you. And what's happened in the last 20 years is my wife and I have gone on a journey together because we had to look each other in the eye and ask a simple question. Do we want to stay together? Because we both knew it'd be easier to get divorced. It'd be easier to shake hands and go, we gave it a good shot. And maybe I'll get it right with the next one. And my wife looked at me with the loving way that she has this beautiful knack of saying the right thing at the right time. And she said, oh, no, you're not getting out of this alive. I've invested far too much work in you. And we got some outside help, and we went back into the steps. And I went into the steps in a different way. It wasn't about not drinking, but it's always about not drinking. But I went to the steps with a different emphasis. I wanted to find out what the hell was wrong with me. How can I take something that I love so much and treat it so appallingly? What the hell is wrong with me? And I remember I wrote the inventory to end all inventories, and I got to the end, and there was one answer with this inventory, and I didn't like the answer, so I wrote another inventory and shared another fist step. And I got the same damn answer. The answer is so embarrassing and so shameful, I don't want to tell you, but I'll tell you what the answer was. I didn't think my wife deserved God. Now, those words weren't on the page, but that's what I wrote meant. I love you. I know I should be treating you the way that God wants me to treat you. I know I should treat you like a gift. I know I should treat you the way that he would if he was running this deal. But you know what? You first. I was so entrenched on her side of the street, I couldn't even see my own behavior. And I had to turn my marriage over the care and protection of God as I understood him. And when I went into the seventh step about my marriage, it was that it's not my marriage anymore. It's God's marriage. And my job isn't to fix my wife, correct my wife, do anything. But my job is to serve my wife. And I'll tell you what, I'm not built for that. You see, I want to tell you that I had this horrible moment in my life and everything changed, but that's not true. What I found out is it's hard to live a life of self-will and suddenly turn on a dime and suddenly you're not that guy. But I had something I didn't have before, and that was the willingness, and that was the humility to know that the best I can do under my own power is throw the woman I love down the hallway. And I started to make some changes. And I found something else out about how the steps are interconnected. You know, there's a warning in the fifth step. And it tells you two reasons why we should do a fifth step. They give you the best reason first. They say, if we skip this vital step, we might not overcome drinking. But then it says, we usually find a solitary self-appraisal insufficient. And one of the things that's happened to me as I've stayed sober over the years, and I don't know if you identify with this at all, is I get well. You ever think that, you know, I should call my sponsor, and then your next thought is, I know exactly what he's going to say, so you don't call him, and it feels like you did? There's no greater block to spiritual development than the ego disguised as experienced in Alcoholics Anonymous thinking, I don't have to talk to people. A solitary self-appraisal will always be insufficient. You see, I was confused by marriage, the mystery of it. What do women want? What do women think? Why do women act that way? What a, never understanding that all the answers to all the mysteries of my marriage were contained in the woman sleeping peacefully next to me in the bed every night, and I never thought to ask. And I started to ask. I remember doing an exercise with my wife. I heard it. Somebody suggested it to me. It was a silly thing. And what you do is you go up to your wife and you go, on a scale of 1 to 10, rate me. It sounded simple. Walked up to my wife. On a scale of 1 to 10, honey, give me a number. She had a number instantly. Didn't have to think about it. Not the number I was thinking of. <laughs> Next part of the exercise, control your facial reaction to that. And I said, well, if I am perhaps a 6, as you say, and not a 7, how do I get to be a 7? She had an answer for that. Didn't even have to think about it. You know what she said? It'd be really nice if you looked at me when I talked to you. Here's my intellectual reaction to that. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I look at you when I talk to you, but I'm trying to get along. I'm trying to be a better man. I said, honey, I'll make it a piece of spiritual business. I'll take that to God. Thanks for being honest with me. 
Two weeks later, we're on the couch. She wants to talk to me about something that's very important to her. What? I don't know. But she's ready to talk. And she's about three minutes into it, man, and all of a sudden I feel my head start to shake, and I start to go over here, and I catch my head, and I come back, and now I'm going over here. And, I, and I'll tell you, I hit a point of frustration. I would have rather looked at the blazing sun with naked eyes than continue to look at my wife. It was so painful. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, if I'm this wrong about that, what else am I wrong about? everything. You see, I need to get somewhere and I can't get there without the input of the people I'm in relationships with. But yet, what do I do as an ego-driven, self-centered alcoholic? I try to get there on my own. I discount God. I dis discount steps six and seven. I'm going to figure it out on my own. What I'm going to do is use my intellect, my self-will, my self-will run riot, self-obsession to create a better version of me that's acceptable to me. Never thinking to ask the people I'm in relationships with, what do you want me to be? I go to the owner of our company on a monthly basis. We sit down, we have a cup of coffee. I go, how am I doing? He always says the same thing. Oh, Dan, you're doing great. You're the straw that stirs the drink. If you left this place, we'd have to close the doors. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. But what could I be doing that I'm not doing? Oh, Don, you do so much for us. It just wouldn't be right for me to ask you to, what could I do for you? You really want to know? Yeah, I really want to know. And he always has an answer. And it's usually something so small I didn't know it bothered him. It's something that I didn't think was important that obviously he thinks is. And the adjustment for me is about that big. It's no big deal. The adjustments that I make to make my relationships better turn out to be no big deal. The problem was I didn't have the information. And the problem is I don't have the power to carry out the promise when I make a promise to change the behavior. I want to do it, but if I exclude God, I can't do anything about it. I don't have the power to change. Six years ago, my wife rolls up on me. And she says this. She goes, listen, I don't want to start anything. By the way, that's code from your wife. She's about to start something. She goes, I was just curious if you ever plan on making the bed. We've been married 21 years at this point. Now, other men have been asked that question in the history of marriage. They've been asked that question. But I'm proud to say I think I gave the dumbest answer any man has ever given. I said, I thought you liked making the bed. <laughs> and she yelled at me, shockingly, and said, nobody likes making the bed. And I'll tell you what, if you're spiritually fit, if you're simply trying to live your life the way you think God would have you live it, your answer will be quick, and you won't have to write an inventory. You won't have to call your sponsor. And this is what I said. Would you like me to make the bed? And she said, that would be great. And if you see my wife, Eileen, ask her if I make the bed. And if I'm at home in the morning and she ain't in it, I make the bed every day. And I'll tell you what, it's no big deal. It was an adjustment about this big. But I would have never thought of it on my own. There's been a thousand things like that in the last 20 years with my wife where I've changed into the person that she needs me to be rather than the person I think I should be. I listen to my wife differently. I found out there's two different ways to listen to another person that you're in a relationship with. There's the way that God wants us to listen, and there's the way that I listen when I'm in self-will. When I'm in self-will, this is how I listen to you. I'm listening, all right, but I just want to know whether I agree with you or not. Why I'm listening, the judgment machine is in full bore. I'm trying to figure out if you're right or wrong. When I'm spiritually fit and I'm living the way I think God wants me to live, I'm listening to you, but I'm just trying to figure out where you're coming from. I'm trying to figure out what you're trying to tell me. And I know I'm in that place because I ask questions when I'm in that place. There's no question asking when I'm in self-will. I already know you're right or wrong. I don't need your input for that. Character defects are tricky in that they seem to go in remission or almost disappear. And one of the worst things for an alcoholic of my type to do is we get complacent. When I knew an Alcoholics Anonymous, they taught me a very important saying, and they say it to all newcomers. They say, we work our program one day at a time. When I'm brand new in Alcoholics Anonymous, it means this and nothing less. If I go to bed tonight and I'm physically sober. I've had a successful day in Alcoholics Anonymous. doesn't matter what my head or anybody else tells me. But I'm telling you what, 
one day at a time takes on a much greater spiritual significance as time goes on. As time goes on, I start to realize one day at a time, each day is a day I must bring a vision of God's will to all my activities. These are thoughts that must always be constantly. I can exercise my willpower along this line all I wish. It's proper use of the will. How can I bring God into my life? How can I bring steps six and seven? Because the problem is, I think it's my job. And I'm, I'm the first to agree that God can make a butterfly and make a puppy dog's tail wag and make a baby smile, but I got sex problems. I got money problems. I got business problems. I got important stuff. And in an ego-driven, self-centered state, I will not trust God with that stuff. And so it's so important for me with my character defects to remember that today's the day. Not yesterday and not tomorrow, but today's the day I have to be aware of the folly of living on self-reliance. So my decision in the morning is the same as it is every day. Who do I serve? Because bet your bottom dollar, I'm going to serve somebody. Do I serve self or do I serve God? And I spent a lot of time working on my character defects. I don't know if you identify with that. You ever had sponsees come to you and go, I'm really working on my character defects. And you go, stop that. It's a fool's errand. If I could have changed myself. Hey, don't touch me there, Cliff. If I could have changed myself, I'd have done it already. And it turns out where my character defects are concerned, once again, all the steps are interrelated. The time that I used to spend with this chronicalization of all my character defects, and I go out in the world, I've got to watch my anger and watch my judgment and watch my sloth and watch my this and watch. I don't do any of that today. I don't work on myself at all. But you know what I do? I work on my conscious contact with God. And what I found out is just all you've ever asked me to do. It turns out, right, that when I'm simply trying to live my life the way I think God would have me live my life and treat the people in it the way I think God would have me treat them, my character defects can't take a deep breath. They are instantaneously, for that moment, removed. Now, they can be returned. And the way they're returned... My character defects are like the biggest, nastiest tiger you can imagine. But when I'm living in God's will and simply day after day trying to live along spiritual lines, grow along spiritual lines, not perfect, but growing, that's my approach to life. It's almost like the tiger's on this giant leash, this giant chain, and he gets bored. He gets bored looking at him being all spiritual, and he goes in the corner and he lays down. And I almost forget my character defects are over there in the corner. Nasty and vicious. But let me run on self-will for a day or a week or a month. It's almost as though an invisible hand walks over and unclicks the tiger. The tiger's been on the leash so long he doesn't even know he's free at first. But one day, one day, he thinks, someone took the leash off. And that's when I get to act in a manner, think in a manner, react in a manner where five minutes before I would have said, I've been sober too long. That behavior is impossible for a guy like me. And I've experienced it enough time in sobriety. I love it when you leave a meeting and you feel spiritual and then you get cut off and you find out, maybe not. (laughs) It's been a hell of a year for me. And my wife, Eileen, you know, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. February, we're in Maui. We're not go to Maui, people. It was a big deal for us. We went on vacation for 10 days, a uh, trip of a lifetime for us. And, uh, you know, we're old and wrinkled now. My wife's 67, I'm 62. But for 10 days, man, we were teenagers again. You know what I mean? We're in the Pacific Ocean. We're eating mangoes on the beach, fish tacos at night. And we just had this magical, beautiful time. And we come back, and Eileen's got some stuff going on medically, so she went and had this little procedure to check it out. And in March, I'm sitting there in an oncologist's office with my wife of 26 years, and we hear that stuff you never want to hear. Tumor, well-defined, stage 3 rectal cancer. And I want to tell you, in a moment like that, time stops. And whatever problems I woke up with that day, 
my money problems, my sex problems, my business problems, my economy problems, my this problems, these things I had to get together. Instantaneously, all my problems become Teflon coated and slide away. And I'm left with one problem. How do we get through this? And we go through a plan of action and a course of action. And I got to tell you, people would call me up who loved me and knew what we were going through. And they'd say, listen, I know everybody's concerned about Eileen, but nobody talks about the caretaker. How's Don doing? And I laughed and I said, I'm doing great. I said, God's got me in the palm of his hands. I'm just trying not to wiggle. I go, I've never been this effective. I can't wait to see what I can do next for her. It's easy. It's the easiest thing I've ever done. And I was shocked at my selfishness being instantaneously removed, my sloth being instantaneously removed. I mean, I went to work. I had one of the most prosperous periods I've ever had in business. And I was working short time because I had to get off to pick her up, to take her to radiation, to take her to do whatever we want, and to do all the stuff. And I'm keeping the house clean. I'm doing all the stuff that she would normally do, and I'm doing all that. And it's the easiest thing in the world. And why it's going on, I'm asking myself, why is it so easy? Why do I not even notice? Because I notice every... Listen, I'm the kind of guy, I vacuum the living room while you're out. You come home, the vacuum's in the middle of the living room. I want you to know I did it. God forbid you don't notice the rugs clean. I'm leaving the vacuum out. I'm the town choir. When she's out at a meeting and I'm at home, she comes home. I just sit there and go, I unloaded the dishwasher, I fed the dog, I took the trash out. I want credit for everything. All that went away. And it just felt like a privilege and a joy. Because she was going through so much. And there was so little I could do. And you go through all the steps at once. You feel that powerlessness. And you realize you got a step two dilemma. But you don't know, this might be too big for God. And you're taught not to pray for outcome, aren't you? That's so easy when you're new. Don't We don't pray for outcome. We don't pray for things in Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, I'll tell you, that's easy when it's a promotion. That's easy when it's a new car. That's easy when it's your favorite football team and the big game's on. When it's the woman you love more than anything in your life that you've spent more time in that relationship than anything other. She's been so special and good to you and hung in there with other people when it's hard not to pray for her. But I'm taught not to pray for outcomes, so what do I do? And I went to God and I prayed and I didn't know what to pray for. And I said, Dad, I don't know what to pray for. I know what I want, but I can't do that because I don't know what your will is. And I got quiet and I meditated and this thing landed on my heart and what the answer was was gratitude. And I started a conversation with God. It was just two days after a diagnosis. And what I did is in the next 45 minutes, out loud, I thanked God for everything he had done for me and Eileen. I talked about how we met in AA. I talked about our first date. I talked about the silliness of courting her. I talked about how scared I was when I called her for the, the first date. I talked about the good times and the troubled times. I talked about the trouble and the glee and, the, and everything that we did and all the funny stories. I spent 45 minutes talking about the gratitude of the experience I've had with my wife. And when I got done with that, all the fear was gone. You know, I've heard it said that the, the solution to fear is faith. I don't know. I think it might be gratitude. Because the gratitude for what God has done for us carried me through one of the toughest times ever. And she got through her treatment, and then we have to wait for the 90 days to do the big scans, and we do the big scans, and my wife is cancer-free. And that's not everybody's experience. We were sitting on the couch the other day, and I just, you know, we're alcoholics. We have bizarre thoughts, you know. And the, love, the best part about being married to an alcoholic is you get to share it with them because they get it. And I, and I just looked at her and I said, do you ever stop and think like you could be dead right now? <laughs> she never took her eyes off the TV. She goes, you're not getting off that easy. 
Well, I'll say this. I'm out of time. I want to thank you for having me here and for being such attentive listeners. I hope we stay sober forever. Thank you, Jersey Shore. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.